to listen to the entire episode and catch all our content, look for Pod Academy in quotations on all podcasting platforms. Hi, and welcome to Pod Academy, an international podcast that combines pop culture and academics. We post a new episode every Monday. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The story of the flood and Noah's ark has been a staple of human storytelling for 2,500 years, with the latest version being the avant-garde Darren Aronofsky 2014 Noah film, with its distinct gravitas Starring Russell Crowe, Jennifer Connelly, Emma Watson, Ray Winstone, and Anthony Hopkins. So how is this 21st century version of this tale different? And what does it tell us about the evolution of storytelling? What makes this biblical adventure still relevant today? For this episode, we have a very special guest, Gary Stevens of the History in the Bible podcast, to help us sort everything out. Hi, Rutger. Hey, man. How are you doing? Hi, Gary. Hello. Good day. <laughs> Good day. So immediately you want us to know you're, you're Australian. Damn right. <laughs> <laughs> if you're interested in the Bible, Gary has a great podcast where he takes you inside the revolutions and evolutions of biblical studies with loads of uh, historical context. So today we're going to talk about uh, Noah. What did he say? He's going to destroy the world. My father said that one day, if man continued in his way, he's... the creator would annihilate this world. It will not be averted. He speaks to you. You must trust that he speaks in a way that you can understand. I saw water. Death by water. Now I saw new life. A great flood is coming. We build a vessel to survive the storm. We build an ark. What do you want? You don't know your king. There isn't anything for you here. I have men at my back. Can you stand alone and defy me? I'm not alone. It's fair and contrast with the biblical version and the other stories that have uh, come up uh, that are similar. And just to kick things off, uh, what I find most interesting in this movie, and I love this movie, is that it's not so much an interpretation or an adaptation of the biblical story, but it's set as if it's like imagining how something actually happened and was much later recorded uh, in the Hebrew Bible and how and it was adapted. Like the creator was adapted to Yahweh, Elohim, God, whatever it is, but it's as, it's as if it's showing you like this is how it happened and you can see the differences uh, recorded later in your ancient uh, Hebrew Bible. I think that's a, that's a smart way to, to approach this movie. It's not trying to be the biblical story. Mm-hmm. I mean, the thing which most impressed me about this movie is how much it relies on the book of First Enoch. I mean, there are huge slabs of First Enoch in it. So much, actually, so much so, you could say the movie is not Jewish at all or biblical. You could make an argument that it is, in fact, advocating a Gnostic theology. God is not referred to. He's called the creator. And in Gnostic theology, there was a second sub-creator below, below the divine entity which created the world. So you could make a case that it's going that way. And I'm surprised that in the bits I've taken from First Enoch, someone's actually read the damn book huh. because it, it's, it, the details are really spot on yeah. in so many little, little cases. I haven't read it. Okay, so tell us, tell us uh, the, the things that you found. First Enoch, it's a really big book for a start. It's um, like two, three times the size of Genesis. It is yeah. fundamentally unreadable. Uh, <laughs> Uh, First Enoch is called the granddaddy of apocalypses. Mm. It was written in, in Hellenistic times, maybe maybe around the time of the Maccabean Revolt, that sort of period. And it is full of fantastical ideas and images of how the Jewish people will take their rightful place on earth. There'll be uh, an earthly battle and a cosmic battle. 
between God and a satanic figure. There's angels. A good word to describe it would be either Baroque or Rococo, or just plain surreal. The Creator formed us on the second day, the day he made the heavens. We watched over Adam and Eve, saw their frailty and their love, and then we saw their fall and we pitied them. We were not stone then, but light. It was not our place to interfere, yet we chose to try and help mankind. And when we disobeyed the Creator, He punished us. We were encrusted by your world. Rock and mud shackled our fiery glow. Still we taught mankind all we knew of creation. With our help, they rose from the dust, became great and mighty. But then they turned our gifts to violence. Only one man protected us, your grandfather Methuselah. We were hunted, most of us killed. Is there a flood out there or is they just like attach that book to the flood story in the movie? As far as I know, there's no flood. Yeah. Where it comes in with this film is in the opening scenes with the Watchers, the Fallen Angels. Enoch is the one who invents the concept of the Fallen Angels. I mean, it basically takes that really weird little reference in Genesis to the Nephilim, yeah. the giants, and blows it out into a surreal novel. So the Watchers are basically Fallen Angels, who uh, come to Earth, and then there's various things going on. And the, the Watchers in the movie are the rock monsters, which you see all the time, who are eventually liberated at the end of the film and returned to heaven. So, um, yeah, I wouldn't advise anyone to actually read first, then. Like you'll, you'll, you'll fall, uh, unless you're on acid or tripping, right? <laughs> then you might get a real, real buzz out of it. Those who lived were left prisoners in these stony shells marooned upon this barren land. We begged the Creator to take us home, but he was always silent. And now you claim that you have heard his call. A man, when it is men who broke the world. But I look at you, and I see a glimmer of Adam again. The man I knew. The man I came to help. So, Rutger, hi, hi, what's your, uh, your main takeaway from the, from the movie to start off? Uh, my main takeaway is that uh, Noah was uh, kind of a badass. <laughs> 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 He's violent. He's, it's dark. And he um, also seemed very bicameral to me. So, uh, Gary, uh, for your uh, for your background, I uh, have an, uh, a constant obsession with this uh, book by uh, Julian Jaynes, The Origin of Consciousness in the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. I've heard of that. It's about 20 years old, that book, isn't it? That's from the 70s, yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah, which, which to us all still feels that's 20 years ago, but that's <laughs> 40 years ago by now. But yes, some, some decades back. And he argues that before the uh, uh, late Bronze Age uh, breakdown of society, before that time, people were kind of operating on a different mental model where they were basically getting messages from the gods. They kind of hallucinated messages in one brain half and then executed them with the other brain half. And then that's kind of culturally evolved into a more integrated uh, psyche. Uh, and so in these old stories, like you see, yes, you, you feel like your inner monologue comes from outside. And so Noah is one of those figures who just, he gets messages from God. Now you have to do this. Now you have to do that. And he doesn't really reflect on it. He just, okay, I guess I now have to do this. No matter how I feel about it, right. I guess I'll now have to kill my granddaughters <laughs> because that's, that's the message, right? <laughs> And uh, so, so I thought that was very interesting. Oh, yeah. It is very interesting. Did he speak to you? I think so. Will he help us? He's going to destroy the world. 
and the other people they don't have that uh, inner monologue god speech going on so they are the more more evolved people yeah <laughs> according to that theory so they all have to die <laughs> right exactly and we have to start to only have people who think that they're talking to god <laughs> yes they walk with god they are pure i am a man made in your image why will you not converse with me so just to contrast the the main character the titular character of the movie and the titular character of the story they could not be more different so noah walks away walks with god but he has like he's an extra in his own story he doesn't have any speaking lines at all doesn't say anything the whole story he's been told do this do that and then he does it build the ark he's giving the di the dimension and exactly he's giving all the orders he's basically like a robot mm. and noah in hebrew it's, it means comfortable he's like a comfortable person and that doesn't uh, translate well into a modern story this kind of character who is not interesting so they created a very interesting uh, noah russell Crow, uh, russell crowe in the movie to give him you know you know stuff that you can work with so in that way obviously it's a and it's an adaptation of the story but uh, it's much more than that it's interesting what are you doing now the wickedness is not just in them it's in all of us i saw it noah there's goodness in us Good up, boys. Shem's loyalty, Japheth's kindness, Ham's integrity. Hmm? Good men. They'd be good fathers. Shem is blinded by desire. Ham is covetous. Japheth lives only to please. I am no better. And you? Is there anything you would not do, good or bad, for those three boys? We would both choose to kill in order to protect our children. Yes. We're no different. We were weak and we were selfish to think we could set ourselves apart. We will work, complete the task, and then we will die. The same as everyone else. Yeah, I thought Russell Crowe is, is a reasonable choice for Noah. He's a fairly robust, solid build. Australian. Technically, is New Zealand. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah, but but like like Canada and America, all Australia claims everyone in New Zealand as honorary Australians <laughs> when they do something good. Uh, I, I bet they don't feel that way in New Zealand. At all. <laughs> oh no, 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 they rather disagree with us. On this. They're wrong. Very much. They're so. wrong to not feel. Yeah. <laughs> now, one person I thought was miscast was Emma Watson as Noah's mm. daughter. Emma Watson, of course, is Hermione from Harry Potter. Yeah. And to me, she just looks like she looks like she should not have survived infancy. She's too delicate. <laughs> She's too frail. She's a little yeah. little pixie, little fairy. Oh, that is true. Uh, <laughs> and another thing I noticed, the costumes for Noah's family, they're all dressed in what I call Bronze Age chic. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, so they're not dirty and grubby like the other guys, led by Chewie yeah. Kane. Oh, no. We've been to a fancy um, clothing store. And we've got the very best things that the Bronze Age can offer. Ha-ha. <laughs> I liked it, though. Of course, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like uh, ancient if you look at, what, at, the, at the materials, but it has kind of this Mad Max yeah. apocalyptic feel to mm -hmm. it. Like the, uh, the, uh, the end result of the movie, the visuals, which we'll, we'll talk about, and the settings and you know, the locations and the clothes, I feel like it works. Yeah, I'll, I'll go into that. I mean, the whole the whole world looks bleh, doesn't it? It looks like a wasteland. Yeah, very drab, very depressing. It's it's yeah, drab, depressing. There's there's no forests and woods. They only appear later right. magically. Everyone's out for themselves. It's and do you know how yeah. we, how we call like I watched this movie with friends a couple of months ago and how in Hebrew you describe this kind of scenery? It's called Genesis uh, scenery. No favorite sheet. Oh, really? Mm. So it's in it's shot in Iceland. So conceptually, it works like it's a very primal, uh, prim primordial, whatever the exact word is, scenery. Oh, okay. So 
So that's a common saying in, mm-hmm. in Hebrew. Nufe Bereshit. Yeah, you would call that, uh, Iceland definitely would be categorized as, uh, okay. as that. Primordial land. Yeah. Yeah, yeah something yeah. like that. But just like the same word, Bereshit, that we, that we, that we use for the Genesis, yeah. the book of Genesis. I suppose if, if you wanted an English term, the only term you've got is antediluvianism. Oh, that's nice, though. Oh, explain, please, Rucha. Antediluvian? Before the flood. Ah, well, anti before. Ah, the, okay. Yeah, before the, yeah, before the flood. And you and and people use that. They say people often. who say gravitas might use antediluvian as well. <laughs> no, not <laughs> That's it. Yes. Pelu- yes. If you know what gravitas means, peluvian like pleu, like pleu, like uh, deluvian. Yes. Ah, like deluvian. Yeah. Ah, okay, okay. Deluvian. Yeah. Okay, antediluvian. Antediluvian. Okay. Yeah. Deluvian because antediluvian. To listen to the entire episode and catch all our content, look for Pod Academy in quotations on all podcasting platforms.